they were one of the better two, so they're going to be talking about the project that they worked on and how they took something from the client problem up into the design document. Take it away. All right, so I am Marcus Shell, and this is my cohort, uh, Joshua Luce. We had two others on our team, and they were unable to join us today for the talk. But I want to give credit where credit is due. There's, there's our name to the print, if you need that. Um, so here, here's the gist. I won't make you read all that if you don't want to. So we were tasked with making um, design documents for a software project. Specifically, our team was making a leaderboard application to be used with learning management systems such as Canvas. My understanding is Blackboard had something like this before, but we wanted to update it and bring it up to speed, maybe see if we can make it just a little bit better in some ways. But for the purpose of this talk, I don't want to get too much into details of features, so I want you to use this as an opportunity to talk about that design process. Because a lot of times when we think about software developers, we think about people sitting behind a laptop taking away, but there's actually a lot more to software development than that. So one of the things that we're going to be using is that, uh, we're going to be using a lot of figures, and these figures were made using the unified modeling language, which actually has a few different uses. Um, it's really kind of a modeling framework for planning, and it allows us to build a model of an application. You know, like I say, a lot of times we think about people programming, but we can actually build a very good blueprint for an application without having to do any code at all using this modeling thing. So, a lot of students, I think, are confused. I think Josh was one of them when you get into software engineering two, because you expect it to be more advanced, and in a way, it kind of is. But in software one, we do programming. We do absolutely no programming in part two of software engineering. And so that brings up the question, like, why do we do this? Well, it's about teaching us planning skills. One of the reasons that uh, planning is important is if you're like me, you've probably tried to do something on the fly before, you just try to wing it. But a lot of times what you end up doing is you buy materials that maybe you need, but you don't know how to use them properly. Or you forget something that you need that is really important. You have to make multiple trips to the store. Sometimes you end up messing up the materials you bought. And then you end up costing yourself a lot of time and money. Um, with software uh, engineering, it's really important that we do this planning because man hours are expensive. And sometimes whenever you do implement something with core planning and deadlines on you, you could not be able to go back and reverse some of the things that you've messed up. And also, security is really, really hard to uh, fix. Like, um, so here's a good example of that. Just a quick word about security. We're not going to talk a lot about security, but throughout the whole talk, it's a good thing to keep in mind that uh, security is not something that you tack on as a feature. It's something that has to be blended into your development process from the very beginning. And this uh, chart on the right was one that we used for a paper we wrote here in the class that I thought was very informative. The, it's it's three-dimensional. The z-axis, is the vertical axis is your cost. And you see that otherwise it's uh, different phases. One axis tells you when you've caught a bug or a security problem, and the other one axis is when you correct it. And notice that the later you go in both of those, the cost to fix it is exponential. So you really don't want to be doing security at the end. You need to blend it into the, the entire process. So my advice is, as we look at some of these examples, just in the back of your mind, think, how would I incorporate security planning into this set of process? So um, the first thing we want to talk about is a requirements document. This was the first step of planning for us. And it's kind of like a contract between you and the person that you're making your software for. You're going to put all of the required features and standards that you have for your <coughs> product there. They're going to tell you things that they absolutely have to have. You're going to tell them what you can offer them. And you're going to put it into an actual physical list. This sets limitations on the scope of the project. So it says, I will do this and I will not do this. And it's actually kind of a no-no we found out to add extra features. This is known as scope creep. If you start doing this, you're technically bridging your contract a little bit. And you don't know always if they want that. And you can also be costing yourself time that you can be making sure that what you were supposed to do is working correctly. So we don't want to add anything more or don't want to do anything less than what's on the requirements document. 
Okay, so requirement documents examples for us, a few examples were our application was going to display grades in the form of a bar chart set up like a leaderboard. Users should be able to customize the colors of the bar chart to please them, and they can identify like their own grade with a particular color if they like. Um, teachers need to be able to hide student standings in the event that maybe a student drops the course so they don't just have like a zero floating at the bottom of the leaderboard for the rest of the semester. And also, professors need to be able to set different milestones. So we have a lot of different features that really need to be in there. And then another thing was is we don't want to store any unnecessary data because even though it is supposed to be anonymized, if anything goes wrong with that anonymity process, we don't want that to be on us. So we're not going to store any data we don't have to. All right, the next thing we talk about is the component diagram, which is basically laying out all of the major players in our game of uh, this leaderboard application. We've got the learning management system, which is Canvas. We've got the leaderboard. Canvas has its own built-in gradebook that we can't touch. We have to talk to Canvas to get those grades. And then we've got uh, the leaderboards database. That, that's where we can store our like preferences for each user. Canvas is not going to with that for us. And then the teacher and student are on here as components because they're users. No, they're not objects, but they do play a part here. And it's important for us to make a distinction between student and teacher because they have different permissions. Okay? And this is what we call a use case diagram. This is a, a very nice document. It seems a little bit simple, but it actually is very, it goes a long way in helping us organize things. What we lay out here is that for the, the two main users that we've got, what sort of things will they want to do with the application? And when we break those apart, that helps us to think, okay, when they do this, they're going to click this button, and when they click that button, some things have to happen. But all of those things may be very different. So by having this, we can make kind of a, a short list of more specific things that our application needs to do. Whenever we find one of those tasks that we want to accomplish in a particular, particular sequence, we will use what we call a sequence diagram. We won't show you all of them, but this is a, a good example of one because I think it's rather easy to follow. We, uh, we see three different rectangles at the top. These are different entities and little pieces that are interacting with each other again, kind of some components. And in this case, we just started with the application because this uh, sequence diagram shows us the process in which we would talk to our database. We use a class called connection that speaks to the database on our behalf because that kind of encapsulates some of the uh, login info that we need so that we're, uh, we're not sharing some of that. People can't get that as easily. And uh, basically, this just shows step-by-step -step the process. We start at the top, and the little vertical bars we see are called lifelines. When those stop, that means that that entity is no longer in the picture. It's not being used. And sometimes that means it's been deallocated from memory. So these are very useful because they help us to design the next step. So, okay. so real quick, what we've seen so far is the requirements document, component diagram, use case diagrams, and sequence diagrams. These four, in my opinion, make a very large, a, a bigger category, which is oriented around the overall planning, because we haven't really got too much in the implementation. We just kind of got like a, this is what I want to do sort of approach. The next things that we're going to look at are the class diagrams and the database diagrams and interface mockups, and that's about all we have. So the next thing on the list is the class diagrams. So class diagrams are basically just kind of a tree of all the different pieces of code that we will write when we get to the implementation process. The top half of each class diagram tells us what sort of data that class needs to hold on to to do its job, and the bottom is the list of tools in its toolbox to accomplish its goals. And they're just connected in sort of a way to show, say who can talk to who. All right, and so one of the more complicated ones we needed to do was the database diagram. The database diagram basically shows how our internal information will be stored and organized. That's probably, to, to me, one of the more complicated figures, but it's very nice that we have this language to talk about it because whenever you go to implement it, you can just look at this and you know exactly how everything needs to be set up just from this figure. All right, and the interface design. Basically, for interface design, this was our last step, and we just want to show the, the, uh, the people that are going to be using this application, what they can expect their user interface to look like. And this also helps us to plan how everything should go together, because sometimes seeing it actualized tells you a little bit more about what you're actually doing. So we'll just take a quick look at these. 
This is our main page. We've got a few different buttons that can be used to navigate different places or modify the leaderboard. Um, if we go to the uh, settings button, we'll see this next page. And this is where users can specify their colors and choose what sort of notifications they might want to receive regarding the leaderboard. And then the last major one is the uh, milestones and uh, the leaderboard editing pane for teachers. This is what teachers will be able to see, no one else will be able to do this. And we think that uh, this is probably an improvement to what was there before for editing your leaderboard as a teacher. Alright, so in conclusion, software development involves a lot more than coding. There's a lot of planning that goes into it. There's a lot of steps to developing software, and it's not all about just sitting behind a keyboard and pecking away. And uh, security shouldn't be an afterthought. You should always start early and save money. And uh, proper planning just makes for easier and safer implementation in general. Thank you. As far as our practice in the classroom, it was nice because we didn't actually have to mess with anything. But as far as verbal standards are concerned, I don't think we have to worry about it too much because one thing we didn't talk about is whenever a user will log in, there's actually an authorization process that the user gives our application permission to uh, navigate on their behalf. But also, um, whenever we get grades, everything is anonymous. Whenever we talk back and forth with the learning management system, the current user that's logged in will be able to say, hey, give me my ID, and then our application can use that and their username that's already stored there to uh, highlight their grade and their grade only. So they can't see whose grades are whose. They okay. just know which one is theirs. Right? I'd be curious, um, especially like in smaller class settings where like you know who the good students are, and so like those kind of things, like issues of and certainly if a teacher felt like that, that was an issue, they could certainly just not set it in the classroom. You know, another thing, just, just an additional thing to maybe like further inform your research question, is like in looking at the research on like, you know, how leader boys affect like student performance and outcome and stuff, because that would definitely lead to like the importance of this project and everything. Yeah. Absolutely. Any other questions? Thank you.